Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, today. We have a uh, great uh, presentation for you coming up. Um, Biosynthetic presents sustainable lubricants. Uh, Mark Miller is going to share his knowledge with us today and talk a little bit about uh, his company and the sustainable lubricants. So we're really looking forward to that, but let's get through a little housekeeping first. Um, if you have any troubles with audio or anything like that, you can give us a call at the number on the screen. It's 847-825-5536. Uh, so, any issues, give us a call or you can send us an email and we'll get that situated for you. And everyone is in listen-only mode, so um, if you have any questions, you want to look on the right side of your screen there for the Q&A panel and um, insert your questions there. And throughout the presentation, we'll have a break time uh, for questions and I'll share those questions with Mark. So, throw them in the Q&A question panel and we will get to them. So, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker today, Mark Miller. There's his contact information as well as the website to the company. So, uh, Mr. Miller is a serial entrepreneur with special emphasis on bio and sustainable technologies. Prior to BT, he co-founded and was the CEO of Terrasol Technologies Limited an environmentally safe chemical products company, uh, which is great for the current climate we're in right now, so it's excellent. He led this organization from startup until his exit, and they created a profitable, sustainable global industry leader. Um, Mr. Mills also has a BS in chemical engineering from Tufts University and an MBA from Manhattan College. And he also sits on the board for the National Foundation for Animal Rescue, which is also really good. Uh, he and his wife, Shay, adopted more than their share of homeless critters. So not only is he looking out for the environment, he's looking out for the animals, which is awesome. So Mark, I'm gonna turn things over to you and uh, break it away. Hi, Stephen, I really appreciate that. I hope I can live up to that fantastic introduction. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming here today and listening to our webinar. I hope uh, it hits all your hot buttons and answers a lot of questions. If you've got more questions, as Stefan said, you can uh, ask them here, um, and we'll show you how to find us uh, by the end of the the, uh, the end of the webinar. But I'd like to also say, looking back on my career in, in environmentally sustainable technologies, uh, I've been doing this a really long time. And it's, it's so long ago that green in those days was still a color. Um, so what I'd like to do today is, um, is, talk, is tell you a little bit about um, biosynthetic technologies, delve into the driving factors for people using sustainable and environmentally preferable lubricants, then deep, take a deeper dive into our products and some of the prototype formulations we've put together, sharing with you some of the data. Um, so I hope that satisfies your, uh, your objectives. Uh, and let me, let me move forward. Uh, the vision of biosynthetic technologies is to deliver sustainable innovations for uh, delivering innovations for a sustainable future. We are very, very focused on sustainability. Uh, we're very, very focused on delivering products. We have products available right now. Um, one other note, um, with, with regard to this pandemic, um, we do have sampling materials and our sampling house is open and getting products out. If your laboratories are open and you're able to work with our products, we are perfectly happy to send them out. Um, our research team is working split shifts at a socially distant uh, and uh, very careful um, distance so um, we can get some work done and, and help you with all of that. We do have commercial quantities of our BT-22, both in the United States and in Europe. So if you need any, let us know and we can get it to you. So I wanna tell you a little bit about biosynthetic technologies. Um, we are an independent leader in biosynthetic and sustainable uh, solutions. 
Um, as I mentioned, our vision is to deliver innovative solutions for a sustainable future. And our mission is to be the, the premier base fluid supplier across a variety of specialty markets. We've been around about 10 years. Um, we've been making the Estelides. Uh, we are headquartered in a phenomenal facility um, with one of our investors, the Heritage Group. They have a awesome research facility and uh, we're working out of that. We have some of the greatest toys that you could imagine, all kinds of testing equipment. So if you need some formulary help or some testing help, we can be able to do that. Uh, we do have a very robust uh, intellectual property portfolio of, of a wide range of patents, both domestically and worldwide. Our focus though, is to use these patents to protect our customers' ability to formulate with our, our estelides. So we don't want anybody patenting finished lubricant formulations that use our products and walling off anybody else's ability to bring these products to market. Uh, one of the cool things about estelides is they are highly customizable. Uh, we can change uh, alpha and beta groups that will give it different types of performance. We can change the number of oligomers that we have, which will increase or vis decrease viscosity. Um, we can functionalize those beta groups to change its cold temperature performance. Um, our focus to date has been to enhance and maximize oxidative stability and hydrolytic stability, which are well-known weaknesses of bio-base oils and in particularly bioesters. So while we can change those around, um, we wanted to make these molecules as oxidatively stable and hydrolytically, hydrolytically stable as possible. Uh, we're currently working on decreasing pour points and we have some early formulas, early products that can get down to minus 50 C. So here's our current family of products. What we tried to do is take a low viscosity material, BT4, which is an ISO 22. Uh, we have a middle grade viscosity, uh, BT22, which is an ISO about 150. And then we have BT75, which is our heavy viscosity product, which is about an ISO uh, 680. What you can see about these products is they have very high bio-based content. Uh, our objective is to maximize bio-based content as well. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So how do we see ourselves when we look in the mirror, our path forward? Um, it is our intention to supply base fluids, cocktails, kind of combinations of chemistry and ethylides, as well as some components. Um, we really don't want to be in the finished products market, although we are working on prototype formulations, which I'll share with you a little bit later on to help our customers with their formulations and see how we fit into their current formulas. Uh, we're happy to support you. We spend a lot of time, obviously, working with our estelides in formulations, co-blending with other materials. We're happy to help with you and work with you. Um, we do have a fully formulated API certified um, GF5 engine oil, which we launched earlier this year and are now selling on Amazon. And the product is far exceeding expectations. I will talk about the USDA Bio Preferred program a little bit later on, but the federal government, state government, military, and other agencies like that are trying to utilize bio-preferred products, and I think that's helping drive some of these materials. So why do we use, in the industry, why do we use environmentally preferable products? What are the problems? Well, it's very, very hard to prevent a lubricant leak or spill. Um, they happen suddenly and are frequently unplanned, or always unplanned, really, and you've got to stop whatever you're doing, fix whatever's broken, and make sure that you can clean it up. What happens is you lose productivity, 
Uh, fines and remediation costs are increasing significantly. Uh, there obviously is damage to the environment um, and you're getting significant uh, negative community public relations. Everybody's walking around with a cell phone. Everybody's posting to media and the heads of these organizations just want to stay out of the headlines. People are continuously setting higher and higher sustainability goals. When I first began in this industry, we considered sustainability having renewable content, making it from vegetable oils or other renewable materials, and having it be safe for the environment. That is biodegradable, non-toxic, and non-bioaccumulating. As the industry matured, um, people wanted to work, and we had to compare it uh, to be equal to or better than petroleum products. Early in the bio day, biolubricant days, there was a movement among some of the blenders to have separate specifications for bio uh, vegetable based products, which I thought was a terrible idea because again, your hydraulic system, your gear system, they don't really care whether it's biodegradable or not. They only care that it works. And then finally, it had to cost uh, be com comparable to conventional products or other products of similar performance. So the bar keeps getting set higher and higher, and now it's higher still, where people are looking for what is your carbon footprint? What is the total life cycle assessment? How does it affect social impact? Is it creating jobs? Is it taking away jobs? Is it, um, is it uh, substituting food for fuel or food for lubricants? And then what is the economic impact of the stakeholders? So the bar keeps getting set higher and higher, and that's where we uh, play. Um, we believe in circular sustainability. Um, we're looking at every step from our cradle to our gate. So we're looking at our raw materials, our manufacturing impacts, our, our uh, manufacturing processes and our material handling. And we think we've done a good job. Um, our raw materials are uh, both environmentally and socially sustainable. Our farmlands do not compete with food crops and our crops can be harvested multiple times in a single planting. And then when you need to, you can replant the materials and they'll grow back again. Um, for each metric ton of our material produced, 9.16 of six tons of carbon dioxide is absorbed. So what happens is when our material reaches our warehouses and then your warehouses, you're in a carbon negative situation, which you can pass on to your customers or use with regard to your stakeholders. The way we do that is our crushing our fields, our crushing, our processing, our manufacturing are all located geographically near each other so we don't have major impacts on CO2 usage in traveling uh, and shipping. And finally, um, our primary manufacturing facility and some of the things we're challenging with our newer facilities is to have renewable energy. Our primary facility is 100% renewable energy with electricity coming from a wind farm, and our boilers are powered with uh, the hulls from the seeds prior to cut crushing. So we think we've covered a lot of the bases with our materials from sustainability. So what else is driving um, bio lubricants and the bio industry is that there's pressures from all over the world. There's a wide range of eco labels and um, uh, directives, and now there's even growing legislation for various uh, environmental impacts. Um, there's still a lot of confusion with some of the words and some and the definitions, and I hope to clarify some of them as we move forward. But we're trying to cut through some of the noise, make sure that everybody's playing on the same um, same playing field and everybody understands what the terminology is. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a wide range of eco-labels. 
some of which are more prevalent than others, but they're all out there, and we at Biosynthetic Technologies pay attention to all of those. The first one I want to talk about, and what I have found to be the major driver from a commercial and technical aspect, is the US EPA Vessel General Permit. The Vessel General Permit is a wide range of, of regulations that controls the effluence from any type of vessel that is in US waters. There's a lot of details about what they all are, but one of the things is it mandates the use of an environmentally acceptable lubricant, an EAL, in all oil to sea interfaces. And the EPA has gone far as far to define an EAL, an environmentally acceptable lubricant, as being biodegradable, exhibiting low toxicity, and has a low uh, potential for bioaccumulation. Uh, and we think that's a great step forward. Um, we're seeing the industry move forward with environmentally acceptable lubricants in the maritime industry and offshore industries. And uh, we're seeing other, other places around the world sort of following their lead. I mentioned the uh, international maritime organizations made some changes to some of their guidelines that call for environmentally friendly and environmentally acceptable lubricants. Another more major driver that we see here, more so in the United States, is the U.S. Department of Agriculture Bio Preferred Program. Uh, it was part of the Farm Security and Rural Investment Act back in 2002. And what it's trying to do is support the utilization of bio-based products. It's not so much concerned with biodegradability or toxicity, but it mandates the use of, of, of uh, farm-grown materials. As of 2018, there are about 14,000 products that were in the program, uh, a few of which are biosynthetic technologies. Uh, there's several different classifications that are very wide ranging from agriculture and forestry, biorefining, chemicals, et cetera, uh, and, and lubricants and greases as well. And it has been an absolute swimming success from an economic impact perspective. Um, the data shows that it has had a positive impact to the US economy. Uh, and 2016, it was measured at a contribution of $459 billion, and it's been continuing to grow from there. And it has added uh, another 4.65 million workers into the job market. And one of the interesting things about it is that uh, it's not just in the rural areas. This job creation and economic value has increased all throughout the country and even the world. What makes this even more successful in my perspective is that it decreases the consumption of, pet of petroleum in three ways. One is biorefineries are creating uh, 150 million gallons of raw materials each year. Uh, it is displacing 9.4 billion gallons of oil and it is reducing 12.7 uh, million metric tons of CO2 equivalents. So I think it's been an absolute swimming success from that perspective. Uh, the European Eco Label is a new benchmark for environmental products. It has been recently updated. Um, it has changed from five groups to three groups of lubricants defined by their utilization. So there's a total loss lubricant, like a chainsaw oil that has a once through application. There's a partial loss uh, application um, where it's designed to leak like an open gear system or a stern tube oil or a two stroke oil. And then there's accidental uh, loss lubricants, which we know are lost uh, through the utilization, but are not designed to use, uh, to, to uh, be, uh, be lost in its usage, like hydraulic fluids, metalworking, closed gears, et cetera, like that. So part of the, uh, part of the breakdown is in the finished product, depending on the classification, it breaks it down into readily biodegradable, inherently biodegradable, non-bioaccumulative, uh, non-biodegradable, but not bioaccumulative, and non-biodegradable and bioaccumulative. So it sets the bar at meaningful levels of each of these components, which allows people to use bio-based products or biodegradable products 
and more benign materials ultimately. Uh, it no longer requires the use of bio-based content. Obviously, BT, uh, because we have such a high, high bio-based content, isn't thrilled about that, but you win some, you lose. But what it has done, it is it has clarified the meaning of bio-based or biolubricant. And for anybody to claim bio-based or biolubricant, they must have at least 25% bio-based material as tested in the final product. It can be tested in the uh, ASTM 6866, which is carbon 14 dating, and it can't be calculated. The other addition it made that I think is really good is that palm kernel oil and palm oil must be certified to be from sustainable sources. And the Lusk list um, was completely redone to affect these new criteria. Europe is continuing to push forward with some of their environmental regulations. There's the CEN TC19, which is defining biolubricant under the uh, EU labels. Um, and it, it is defining renewability at 25%, biodegradability at greater than 16%, aquatic toxicity at greater than 100 milligrams per liter, uh, 100 ppm. Um, and it's gotta be fit for use uh, by the ISO uh, 280 um, or work for whatever it is. And when in doubt, um, you don't trust, you test. There's a new specification for biodegradation that has been approved in Europe as well. Um, it uses the same principle as the CO2 ev uh, ev um, evolution test, like the OED, OECD 301B, which is what we're more used to, but it uses a different reference source um, it man maintains better um, solubility in, um, in, the, in the water phase and the inoculum, the bugs, the microbes can only come from municipal sewage plants. Um, in the OECD 301B, you can get your bugs from wherever you want and you can play some very uh, good tricks on how to increase your biodegradability by changing your inoculum. Uh, the Europeans also uh, recently updated their Renewable Energy Directive, the RED. They're now using RED2, and it's going to plot the way uh, going forward to the year 2030. Uh, it has raised the overall renewable energy target of 32% by 2030, as I mentioned. Now, what it has done is it set limits for using conventional food-based biofuels, um, as well as blended above 4.1% uh, forecast for the year. Um, one of the things it's done is it, it requires biofuels to compete with other forms of re renewable transportation energy. And from the metrics that they've done, it looks like uh, waste, fats, and oils have the best look uh, outlook for the short term in terms of expansion. Um, there's a big push for uh, cellulosic feedstock, but so far commercial production has been fairly limited, not as easy to think to do as we think it is. Another very interesting piece of legislation uh, is the Dutch um, regu regulation ART 8.30, which does not uh, 8.03, which does not allow seal leakage from water of water contaminating lubricants in any Dutch waterway. Um, so it's applicable for inland shipping, new builds, dry docking. It's been in effect since 2015, and it's going to have a very serious effect in uh, stern tube seal oil, as well as rudder seal oil. And as you can see, the numbers of inland barges are very, very significant. And it, it's going to mandate, or it's going to require ultimately that um, all the rivers moving upstream or downstream, but out of the Netherlands, will also have to have environmentally safe lubricants. So before I delve into our technology, I thought I'd stop and Stefan, maybe there's some questions that have come in that I could address. Yeah, so we have two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, you, you've been going over these different labels and guidelines, you know, and uh, from around the world. And so will these different things influence regulations in the US and what's the, in, what is the influence there? 
Well, as I mentioned, the vessel general permit is now mandated by law. It's been mandated since 2012. So any, any vessel, regardless of where it's coming from that's operating in U.S. waters, has to have an environmentally acceptable lubricant. Uh, it's spreading throughout the world where the International Maritime Organization, which recently published its guidelines for operations of vessels in the polar regions, has, meant, has declared that or stated that um, environmentally safe oils are not considered pollution. So if you do have a stern tube that leaks a bio oil in the polar regions, that's not considered a pollutant. Uh, I think this is an idea whose time has come. Again, I started this back when green was still a color and it was moving very slowly, but I've been seeing it gain momentum. Um, and I think we're never, ever going back to our old ways. Mm. Right, and uh, another question is, you mentioned earlier that kind of the definition of sustainability is still kind of unclear. Um, but what do you think are the, the true key components for sustainability? That's, that's a great question. And I've been talking to people all over the world about their definitions of sustainability. Uh, we at BT are trying to use best practices. But I think sustainability has to uh, encompass um, material sourcing, the growth of materials. Um, it has to encompass social. Is it creating jobs? Is it destroying jobs? Is it feeding the poor and feeding the hungry? Um, is it uh, sustainable from an economic perspective? So does it need subsidies from federal government or can it, can it manage its own, own economic sustainability? Um, I absolutely believe that it's got to be sustainable from an environmental perspective, uh, meaning what happens if the material escapes into the environment? Uh, it must be biodegradable, non-toxic, non-bioaccumulating, -bio and, and situations like that. But we have to look at carbon footprint uh, and a full life cycle assessment. So it's, uh, it's going to be evolving and, uh, and watch this spot because uh, we're keeping our eye very closely on that target. All right, great. Uh, doesn't look like there's any more questions, so let's move on. All right, folks, feel free to ask questions. All right, so what do we like about Estelize and why are we doing that? Um, I, back when I was first doing biolubricants, I had looked at Estelides. Uh, it was a technology developed by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, and they were awesome, um, but I wasn't ready for it, and they weren't ready for me. But what we like about them is they have very, very high oxidative and thermal stability, so you increase the oil life. It's got very low volatility, um, so it has low evaporative rates and is a great base oil for making low viscosity motor oils. It's got excellent hydrolytic stability. And as I mentioned, the vessel general permit and a variety of other maritime applications for EALs. Um, if you're working by water, things are going to get wet. Conventional biolubricants, um, either made from triglycerides or made from some of the esters, uh, break down when they get wet. Uh, it's got great detergency. So it keeps equipment clean uh, and reduces deposits. It's got very, very high biodegradability. So in the event that it leaks into the environment, it breaks down and doesn't kill the fish. And it's got high bio content. So it's renewable materials uh, not derived from petroleum. Uh, we also like estelides because we see them as a chemical platform. Um, we see them as, or uh, in terms of lubricants, obviously greases, industrial lubricants, automotive, but we've done work in processing oils for car, for tires and elastomer, uh, food oils, you know, emulsification and ingredients, plasticizers. Uh, we've done some work with adjuvants. Uh, we're very involved now in personal care space for emollients and sunscreen. So let me tell you a little bit more about our products. As I mentioned, we feel it's the blend of performance, environmental, and physicals, and it's a perfect material for, for making a wide range of, of, of products. What we've tried to do is align 
our specifications and standards to those that we're most familiar with, which are the petroleum standards. Um, so we've got a thin viscosity, light viscosity, middle viscosity, and heavy viscosity. They are completely blendable. So we feel that we can get a full range of, uh, of viscosities with only three cuts. Uh, what you'll see is that the viscosity index is high, ranging from 150 to almost 200. You'll see that uh, the NOAC volatility is very low, uh, which means it can be used in low viscosity materials like engine oils or even low viscosity hydraulic fluids uh, without evaporative loss. Um, not surprisingly, the KRL shear is very low, which means it will maintain its viscosity um, even through high shear stress application. I, I mentioned the different classifications of biodegradability. What I'd like to do is clarify them so we're all speaking the same language. Uh, there are really four definitions of high, uh, levels of biodegradability. Readily biodegradable means it's greater than 60% uh, by a test like the OECD, OECD 301B or others in 28 days, but once it's started to biodegrade as defined by 10% degradation, it's got to hit that 60% in the 10-day window. People call that the 10-day window. Um, that's sort of fallen out of favor lately, but I think it's a really important one because it shows extreme rapid biodegradation of the environment. Ultimately, biodegradable is 60% by the same type of testing in 28 days, there's no window. Inherently biodegradable is somewhere between 20 and 60% in 28 days, and non-biodegradable is less than 20% in 28 days. And I mention inherently uh, because my definition of inherently is not. Um, if you're at 20% biodegradability, you're really not biodegrading. And a lot of people out there market biodegradable products with an asterisk and say as defined as inherently biodegradable. And uh, we think that's uh, misrepresentative and uh, confuses an already confused market sector. Um, our products um, are very high in biodegradability as the, measured by the OEC D301B, uh, ranging from 76% to 88%. And when you saw that the minimum requirement was 60%, we far exceed that. Um, we have very high bio-based contents, ranging somewhere between 70% and 95%, 94%. Uh, we've also done toxicity testing for our products uh, with a range of species. And as I mentioned, uh, the requirement was 100 ppm parts per million or milligrams per liter. Uh, we've done all of our testing at 1,000 ppm and have had no visible effect. We've done some testing at 10,000 ppm, but what we find is the, the species are doing the backstroke in the oil phase. Um, they're fine, but it, it is very confusing for the data. So we're happy to go with 1,000 ppm, and if we need to go higher, uh, I am confident that. Um, I mentioned solubility. Uh, we have a very, very low aniline point You'll see BT2, 4, and 75 on the far right side of the chart. So having a good solubility, a low aniline point, means it, it will solubilize uh, additives very well. It will dissolve with a variety of different, or mix with a variety of different base oils. Uh, we've done quite a bit of testing with PAOs, group 1, 2, and 3 mineral oils, as well as a whole variety of esters. So uh, we're very comfortable with that. The other aspect that I had mentioned before with the low aniline point or good solubility is it tends to keep uh, sludge and varnish down and keep it. Uh, we talked about uh, hydrolytic stability and some of the weakness as a, as a major weakness of some of the environmental fluids. So we've been doing quite a bit of testing uh, with what we call the hydrolytic stability torture test. It's simulating long-term exposure to say a, an application at sea or by the water. What we've done is we've mixed in 1% by water. We've maintained uh, the temperature at 180 degrees Fahrenheit. 
which is a sort of a normal operating hydraulics temperature for a hydraulic system. And we're continuously stirring at 500 RPM to keep the oil and water in the same phase. And then what we do is we uh, have been measuring the acid increase. You can see that for the BT4, 22, and 75, there's been very little to no acid increase. You'll see that uh, some of the esters have literally gone off the chart. Um, some of the other petroleum-based products have also, also done very well. But we're really happy to see that even in a real life simulated real life application, uh, it does very well. Uh, I also mentioned oxidative stability. Um, we took a, a variety of different materials, same sort of group, both with the petroleum-based products, synthetics, and a wide range of esters. And you'll see that we took a 1% treat, 0.5% phenolic, 0.5% aminic uh, antioxidants, all treating the same materials with the same antioxidant system. And you'll see that we have top tier performance equivalent to a group three or a low viscosity uh, PAO. Much to my surprise, the high viscosity PAO did not do so well. And I was not at all surprised by sort of the lower performance of some of the. Another interesting phenomenon that we found is when you're looking at uh, the material uh, in the RPVOT, um, it, it stays stable for a much longer period of time. Um, the RPVOT is defined uh, It's a pressurized vessel. As the oil gets absorbed, as the oxygen gets absorbed into the oil, that is oxidation. The end point is 25.4 PSI drop. So our material, our BT75, has a 25.4 PSI drop at 11 uh, 1,100 minutes, almost 1,200 minutes. But you see that it hasn't had the induct uh, oxidative break. And it goes another 700 minutes, 600 minutes out to 1820 before it breaks, which indicates to me a longer useful life, uh, even if it has um, a, a smaller RPVOT result. We continue to claim the RPVOT results because that's our, our current test. Um, we've also done a wide range of elastomer tests with the base fluids. Um, and in terms of nitrile, polyacrylate, and floral elastomer, you can see it meets all the industry standards at the, uh, at the test temperatures and durations that are required. Uh, so we, before I get into our prototype formulations, uh, maybe I'll turn it back to, to you, Stefan, and see if there's any more questions. Yeah, we've got uh, got a couple. So let me just start at the top. Um, one person is asking, they're wondering what the minimum range of estolites, uh, what the minimum range for estolites is as their um, oligomers. Ah, so... So what we can do is um, our minimum range is, is one oligomer. Um, Mother Nature likes a carbon-18 carbon chain. So those are very prevalent in the environment. So most of uh, the, the fatty acids that we look at are the fatty acid chain. Um, and that will give you the one oligomer um, will get you like BT4, which is almost an ISO 22. It's easy to, to combine uh, longer, longer groups of the oligomers. Getting shorter chain oligomers, you can get them, uh, but they're much more rare in nature, and therefore much more expensive. Um, so we are, we are working on some variations uh, with capping. Remember those alpha and beta groups that will reduce the pore point, uh, still using a C18. Uh, ester and bringing the or ligamer and still and bringing down the uh, the pore point to uh, minus minus 50 C. All right, good. And uh, is the biodegradation mentioned? Is that referred to pure polymers or oligomers? Uh, the the biodegradation that I mentioned is we've done the testing 
in the, the finished base oil. So the biodegradation of the BT22, uh, BT4 would have one oligomer. Uh, the BT22 usually has four, five, six oligomers. Um, but it's the breakdown of that particular molecule um, where it is. So it's the full base oil as, as it would be seen by a customer or be utilized in a formulation. All right, and someone's asking, um, do they work with pore point depressants? Uh, uh, that's uh, additives, pore. Yeah, that, that's a great question. We've looked at a, a wide range of pore point depressants. Um, one of the, I would say, characteristics of these estylides, because we focused on the high oxidative stability and high hydraulic stability, we traded some of the pore point temperatures were about minus 20s. We can get a couple of degrees with different types of pore point depressants, but it's not where we want it to be. Uh, what we have found is with co-blending with a light viscosity PAO or a light viscosity group two or three stock, you can bring down the pore point. As I also mentioned, some of the new novel technologies and some of the new molecules we're putting together, we've gotten materials down to minus 40, minus 50 C. So uh, we're still working on that. Um, but if anybody has a four point depressant that works with, you know, bioesters, uh, we'd love to take a look at it and incorporate them into our formulations or certainly recommend them to our, our customer base. Good, and uh, looks like there's follow up to that. How how might the, that compare to esters in terms of price? Ah, with regard to pricing, um, we are comparable to sort of the low. Now, there's a full range of esters and a full range of pricing everywhere from very inexpensive to crazy expensive. Uh, what our data in the marketplace tells us is we are very competitive with the lower viscosity esters and significantly less expensive than the high viscosity esters. So we think that our estylides are a perfect uh, substitution for high viscosity esters and a great performance improvement as compared to the lower viscosity ester. And uh, two more questions, it looks like. Um, so what is the cause of the super, or I'm sorry, not super, superior oxidative stability results on the standard RPVOT test and the difference between the 18, 21 minutes and the 11, 90 minutes? Right, well, our, our, S, our ester bond is a secondary ester bond, which is sterically hindered and protected against oxidation. Um, we're not really sure um, why uh, at the RPVOT, the 25.4 PSI, we don't have that break in the oxidative stability, but we've seen it time and time again where um, our, our oxidative break and our oxidative inductive point is significantly further out in time than our 25.4 PSI drop. So I think even beyond what we're reporting as the RPVOT testing, uh, the useful life of these estylides will far exceed that. Okay. And the next question here is, do you have other elastomer compat uh, compatibility data available as well? We have, we have a ton of elastomer compatibility data. Um, we've been doing a lot of compatibility studies. One of the weaknesses that we have seen of other ester or bioesters is incompatibility with some of the natural rubbers. Uh, we see our materials as having better performance than that. So if, um, if anybody's looking for more elastomer data, um, please feel free to contact us and we'll share with you the, the longer story. But yeah, that's something that's very important. Great. Um, and I think I have some elastomer data in some of our performance materials. So let me uh, let me push on, and um, maybe that'll answer some of the other questions regarding that. How's that? Great. 
So with regard to hydraulic formulations, um, what we wanted to do in our first formulation was to use 100% base oil uh, for an, an estalide. So we used our BT-22. We took a commercially available uh, additive package um, that we feel will meet the eco label. And we put our, our, uh, our first hydraulic fluid formulation. Uh, we also think it'll get all the pump testing requirements based on other work we've done with it. And you can see that, um, that it meets, it's basically an ISO 138 of ISO 140. Obviously nobody uses those, but that's the straight BT-22 with the ad pack. And what we found was that we get a very high uh, viscosity index you know, this chart is sort of not representative uh, because our BT-22 is 169 and with the additive package is 167. That's essentially the same number where I live. We looked at the oxidative stability and that got us a 1200, almost 1247 minute RPVOT. Um, and that that is far in excess of what you'd need to have. Uh, it offered great hydrolytic stability as measured by the requirements of the Parker Denison limits and the shear stability also as measured by the uh, shear stability limits as well. So we think it's a um, it's a good a good uh, product from from a performance perspective. And then we did the elastomer compatibility as compared to the ISO 15380. Um, and we did HNBR, which is normally a weakness of uh, some of the uh, some of the materials, and it, it was far uh, it was well within the requirements of the ISO requirement. We did FKM, uh, and not surprisingly, it needed the HEES limits. And then uh, the NBR1, which is typically a difficult elastomer for uh, natural esters or synthetic esters naturally derived, uh, we also were able to meet those requirements. Uh, we did a second formulation with a different commercially available zinc-free additive package. What we wanted to do was hit an ISO 140, uh, an ISO 40. Um, we used roughly 70% BT-22. We co-blended with a PAO2. We thought that would, and found it did, reduce our pore point um, and increase um, and reduce our viscosity as well. So uh, that worked out very well. Uh, what it did do though, not surprisingly, was reduce um, the flash point due to the low viscosity PAO, uh, but it still had excellent oxidative stability uh, at almost 800 minutes for the RPVOT um, and the induction endpoint we measured at 823 minutes. Uh, did a great job with its hydrolytic stability as measured by the D2619. Uh, so we thought that was a pretty successful product. In terms of gear oil, um, what we did here was again, we wanted to maximize the usage or utilization of the, of the estalide. So we took our BT75 HP, which is a high, higher polar version of our standard BT-75. We used a commercially available additive package, uh, which recommended treatments between two and 4%. Uh, we used a four point depressant as recommended by the manufacturer. What we did was then we did an industry survey of a variety of different gear oils, some of which are bio, most of which were either petroleum or synthetic petroleum. We classified those and we were able to show that utilizing the full dosage of the additive of 4% treat, we far exceeded any of the other materials in terms of uh, weld load. And even at the, the bottom end of the spectrum of the treat, we were able to meet the best in class uh, gear oil with wear, uh, wear protected well, weld load. And our 75, without any additives at all, sort of ran with the pack with the also ran. So we felt really, really good about that. We also did an, um, an all estalide version, uh, shooting for an ISO 22. Um, 
We used a, another, well, I guess this is an experimental additive package. Um, we believe it'll be Euro, Euro Eco label capable. That's one of the things we wanted to see. Um, we came pl pretty close to our viscosity targets. We maintained a very high flash point. We had excellent four ball testing, both uh, wear and extreme pressure. And we did very well in terms of salt water. Um, what we then did was we found two commercially available, uh, environmentally friendly gear oils uh, on the market. And we measured them up against the DIN 51517 and the China GB5903. And um, you know, we met all those specifications and all those requirements. We did see some of the commercially available materials failing. Um, one failed in rust and the other failed in demos. Um, so uh, we felt that utilizing this uh, material, this experimental material, uh, we were able to hit the targets and meet our objectives. We think this is a great op opportunity for bio high performance bio-based greases. Um, we put together a formulation uh, that maximizes the use of our BT22. Uh, we cooked it at 220 degrees C, which is uh, pretty exceptional for a bio, uh, bio ester um, and making the processing of the grease much easier. Uh, we homogenized it at 6,000 PSI um, and we got great results um, over all the requirements of a gear oil, uh, I'm sorry, of a grease, um, hitting some of the targets of uh, GCLB, although that really wasn't one of our base targets. And passenger car motor oil, as I had mentioned, um, we have, we have, uh, sorry about that, we have come up with a, an escalide uh, engine oil that meets the API uh, GF5, uh, utilizing 35% escalide uh, targeting. We were targeting a minimum of 25% bio-based content to meet the USDA bio preferred. Um, and we used group three base stock. We wanted to maintain the synthetic perspective. Uh, so it had uh, great high VI. We were able to minimize the amount of viscosity modifier, which uh, improves the performance and reduces the cost. It met the API SNRC, um, met the GF5, and we are currently selling it on Amazon. As I mentioned, uh, it's being driven, number one, because it's got great bio-based content. Number two is it's got great performance. And number three is it meets the USDA bio-preferred. Uh, we did a 100,000 mile, 150,000 mile engine cleanliness field trial in a taxi cab fleet in Las Vegas. Um, and at the end of the test, we were trying to do between 7,500 and 10,000 mile chain drain intervals. But you know, with those cab fleets, it's hard to hit those numbers uh, right on. But regardless, the engine on the right is our product. You can see it's basically pristine. And the engine on the left is a petroleum standard, petroleum based. Uh, oil that has uh, deposits and sludge built up over the, the test. Uh, we also did about a two-year field trial with the Department of Defense and several municipal and state fleets, all of whom found that the SLI formulation met all their requirements. We're moving forward uh, with our GF6. Um, we're not pushing hard because we know that most of the big players are scrambling to finish their GF6 for their first use next month. Uh, I'm perfectly happy to have the formulation done by uh, last use next year. Um, this time we're working with a re-refined group three. We think that that'll increase the sustainability aspect of it uh, and give us an excellent marketing uh, opportunity. This time we were able to reach the zero W we have formulas both for a 0W20 and a 0W30. And based on, based on our early testing, we think that we can even do a 0W16 from a viscometric perspective. So, uh, so we're, we're moving forward on that. 
Uh, we are very engaged in our social media portfolio. You can find us on LinkedIn, Twitter, our website, um, and various media applications. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Stefan and see if we have a couple more questions. Yeah, uh, we've got quite a few. Um, so pick, how much pick the easy one, Stefan. <laughs> try my best for you. Hi. Um, how, how much treat rate can estelides go in blends? Ah, that's a great question. Um, so you can use 100% estelide as the base oil and whatever the additive treatment is. And sadly, some people are even doing it right now. You can use zero estelide in your formula, which we think is a really bad strategy. Um, but we have found improvements in wear, in improvements in cleanliness with a five to cent per ten, uh, five to ten percent uh, treatment. We've also seen uh, additive compatibility and seal compatibility with very low treat rates in that five five percent range as well. So you can use it all the way from you know five percent all the way up to one hundred percent of the base oil content. Okay, and um, the same person uh, as oligomers, what number average molecule or molecular weights or weight average molecular weights are estelides? Well, as I mentioned, um, we utilize a C18 uh, oligomer. Mother Nature gives them to us readily. Um, we can build. Um, Oligomers all the way up from just the one with the BT4 all the way up to, I don't know, 12, 13, 14 oligomers, maybe higher. Um, and that would get you uh, sort of our BT1000, uh, making it a much, much higher viscosity material. Uh, we're looking at shorter length of oligomers, uh, which will give you lower viscosity. Although, as I had mentioned earlier on, they're quite rare. And as a result, um, very expensive to find uh, in nature. Mm. Um, so for the PC lubricant blends, are estelides able to be applied in lower grades other than 5W? Yeah, as I mentioned, right now we're doing two viscosity grades of 0W, um, a 20 and a 30. And we're working on formulations now at a 0W16. Um, we're not ex as excited about 0W16. I think it's a great performance viscosity grade, but it's still a very, very small portion of the market. I see 0W20 and 0W30 being a much bigger part of the market. Okay, and another question here in regards to the G5 motor oil. Uh, is it for sale and where can someone get it? Great question. The GF5 motor oil is available right now. You can get it on Amazon or you can go on to our website, biosynthetic.com, and, and find it there as well. And uh, kind of piggybacking off that, what, do you, what are the biggest hurdles to wider commercial acceptance of these? Well, that's, that's a great question. Um, Commercial acceptance of environmentally friendly lubricants has been a challenge even, you know, for all times. And, um, you know, a lot of it has to do with some of the mistakes that early formulators made where they were trying to use uh, a straight vegetable oil, either a soybean oil or a canola oil as the base fluid. And they tried to use a conventional additive package from one of the key additive guys and put it together and make a biodegradable oil. And it was a great idea and it was a good first attempt. But what the problem was is that the performance of, of, uh, of a vegetable oil was very different than a performance of the mineral oil. So the, um, so the performance of the finished fluid was not really all that acceptable. So early biolubricants were significantly underperforming from a performance perspective and industrial performance perspective. That's really changed. The industry has gotten much smarter. Um, we're much better at formulating. We're much better at doing testing. Uh, but those memories run deep. And 
Nobody ever lost their job for using the same petroleum-based major branded product um, and not making the change. What's challenging is for somebody to say, hey, you know what, there's an environmentally acceptable lubricant. We really should be using it because there's a high degree of exposure for our equipment and our company. We're gonna do some testing with it and make sure that it works well. I'm starting to see that happen more and more. What really drove that from a, a major perspective was a little bit of legislation. When a government says you will use this rather than you should use this, it makes all the difference in the world. That all said, the usage of an EEA, EILs is growing exponentially uh, every year. It is, it is growing at a, at a pace uh, significantly higher than the, than the industry in lubricant spaces. And I, I'm afraid to quote numbers because I don't want to misrepresent them, but it's much, much faster in terms of the growth rate. Great, and uh, someone is asking, how does operating pressure influence hydrolytic stability torture tests? Well, our, our hydrolytic stability torture test, our simulated real life application operates at, um, at, ambi uh, at ambient pressure. So it's really just oil and water in a, in a, in a jar being mixed together. Um, we don't see operating pressures from say pumps um, having a major impact. And our early data is indicating that um, the compressibility of these, uh, of our ethylides is very, very minimal. So I think that there's gonna be some very interesting information regarding the compressibility of ethylides and the benefits that brings under high pressure hydraulic system. All right, and um, so another question here, considering the ester structure of ethylides, do they have viscosity modifying uh, detergent type effects? Yeah, absolutely. So we've seen people utilizing BT75 as a viscosity improver to thicken their formulations. And as I mentioned earlier, even a small amount of, of estalide will, um, will in, increase the detergent characteristics. Okay, great. And so follow up to that. Um, Someone is interested in actually getting uh, some samples in regards to the base oils. Is that, uh, is that we're possible? We're happy to we're happy to provide samples. Our sample house is open even through the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Uh, all you have to do is reach out uh, via our website or our social media or my email, and we'll make sure that we get samples to you. All we ask is that your laboratory be open and that you can uh, work with them and keep us informed as to your progress. Great, so uh, we just have a few more questions and then we can wrap up. Uh, um, so if lubricant is biodegradable and non-toxic, someone's asking, can, can you just pour it down the drain? Is that okay or? That is absolutely not okay. Um, you need to follow whatever your local regulatory guidelines are for disposal of this product. Uh, it can be utilized in a re-refiner. Um, our information, our research has shown that it essentially drops down to the bottoms of any re-refiner, but they'd be, be more than willing to take it. All right. And uh, right now there's, you know, as everyone knows, there's a kind of an oil crisis happening. And what, what do you think this will, or how do you think this will affect the demand for bio-based lubricants? Um, I, I think that the bio-based lubricants is sort of a separate market sector from the petroleum products. I would see the, you know, the, the base oils, petroleum oils go, obviously they're going down in, in price, but um, the esters, the vegetable oils, materials like that, are really not being significantly impacted. Um, I think ultimately, at least for the short term with lower energy costs, uh, moving and processing of these materials 
um, should save money, and we're more than happy to pass some of those savings along to our customers. Great, and it looks like our last question is someone is interested in getting these slides. So would those be available? The slides will be available, and and then you're going to be making, and we'll be making this uh, this webinar available also online. Yep, right. Well, um, that looks like that's it for the questions. Uh, again, if you'd like to reach out to Mark or his company, there's his information right there on the screen there, the LinkedIn, their Twitter, there's other information. Um, I'd like to Mark, like at this point. I'd like to oh. thank Stefan for arranging this, and thanks everybody for their time. I know time is valuable, and I hope that uh, you got something out of this uh, this webinar. Yeah, and thank you for uh, teaming up with STLE to put this on. We appreciate the we appreciate your time. Great, and, thank uh, you.